Hello, I'm going to talk about Igor Stravinsky and his three pieces for a string quartet. The string quartet pieces were written in 1914, and they're a very fascinating work, and one of the reasons I find them so fascinating is that the first piece of the set, which is the one I'm going to focus on, lasts for less than one minute in performance, and yet, despite its apparent surface simplicity, uh, it's actually one of the most sophisticated things that I think you can find in the entire Stravinsky canon. And it's possible to talk about this very, very brief little miniature for 20 minutes or more and never really get to the bottom of it, and that's an amazing thing. So let's uh, have a look at this piece. I'm going to start by giving an overview of the context in which it was written, where Stravinsky was, was living at the time, what his inspirations were, and then I'm going to do a detailed analysis of the work. The string quartet pieces were written in 1914 in the small Swiss village of Les Ains, which lies on the eastern shore of Lake Geneva, and this is during the very beginning of Stravinsky's Swiss years. The composer lived in Switzerland between 1914 and 1920, basically to protect his family and himself from the First World War. And these pieces are very, very interesting from a chronological perspective because they were written immediately before the declaration of war. And they're also interesting in the perspective of Stravinsky's catalog because he wrote them immediately after finishing Le Rossignol, which is an opera that he wrote in a very short period of time, and also uh, less than one year after the premiere of Le Sacre du Printemps. So this is right in the middle of Stravinsky's arguably most revolutionary period, and he writes this, this miniature, this, this very short little work, after uh, these, these major pieces on which he had been working basically without interruption for quite a number of years. Now, what's really interesting about these pieces is that they, they contain all of the formal and technical qualities of Le Sacre du Printemps, but in a much, much more condensed format. So the, the advantage of that from an analytical perspective is that it allows you to see the, 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 the foundations of Stravinsky's compositional thinking uh, in a very, very reduced format. Another interesting thing about this piece is that it is one of the earlier examples of Stravinsky writing a work without having a commission for it, and then later on uh, finding performers to negotiate a commission with. So that's a kind of amazing thing that he, that he managed to do, because usually composers do the opposite. They find a commission, and then they write the piece uh, based on the terms of the commission. But Stravinsky was very clever, and he, he managed to find ways, and he, he did this on a regular basis uh, afterwards throughout the rest of his career. He would always find a way to write the piece that he wanted to write exactly the way he wanted to write it, and then, after it was already finished, find someone to pay for it. So rather amazing. Uh, the other interesting thing about the chronology of this work is that it was written at exactly the same time as the Drei kleine Stücke of Anton Webern, Opus 11, which are three tiny little miniatures for cello and piano. And the Drei kleine Stücke are extremely revolutionary pieces. They're among the most extreme works that Weber never composed. And it's just very interesting from a historical perspective that these two sets of three miniatures were both written at exactly the same time and that both feature the most radical aspects of their respective composers' styles. The first piece of Stravinsky's set uh, was written, in fact, uh, in response to a performance that he saw in Paris, and it was inspired by the performance of an English music hall comedian. So let's have a look at that. So the guy in this photograph here is Little Titch, whose real name was Harry Ralph, and Stravinsky attended a performance by Little Titch in Paris two weeks before writing the first piece of the three pieces for string quartet. And Little Titch was a comedian who had an amazing act that consisted of various uh, sort of acrobatic moves and dance moves that were performed 
with the use of these gigantic shoes that he wore. It was called the Big Boot Dance, and it was very well known, very popular, very famous at the time, and he was all the rage in Paris. So Stravinsky sees this, is very inspired by it, and immediately afterwards, as soon as he returns back to Switzerland, starts work on the first piece of the set. So we know from the sort of memoirs of Stravinsky's wife that he was inspired by this event, and that's what led to the composition of the first piece of the set. So just to give you an idea of, of this background and of the sort of expressive world that Stravinsky was interested in at the time, I'd like to show a video of uh, Little Titch performing in Paris. Now, uh, one quick other point is that Stravinsky often uh, drew inspiration from popular art forms, such as the circus or certainly European folk music, Eastern European folk music, and again, uh, music hall comedians. So he draws all sorts of things into his music, and he and he sort of draws these very fascinating parallels as well, where in, in this particular piece, he's aiming at this kind of very highly colorful, highly characterized form of musical expression. So the first of the three pieces, again, is very condensed, less than one minute long. Nevertheless, it's bookended by a very, very short introduction and a very, very short coda, which feature the same material, namely a drone of two notes played on a viola. So we hear this for three bars at the outset and three bars at the end of the piece. The piece is characterized by the use of repetition, which again was a prominent stylistic feature of Stravinsky's music at this time. And we can see that very clearly in the cello part, which I will analyze in a minute. Now, the other interesting thing about the use of repetition in this piece is that each instrument in its own way contains repetitive material, but the, the repetitions do not overlap. And in fact, what we have in this, in this piece is a series of asynchronous overlapping rhythmic periods. So they don't start and end at the same time, which makes the piece actually quite complex from a formal perspective. In addition to the, the rhythmic stratification of this piece, each instrument also has distinct timbre and pitches and a distinct function within the overall string quartet. So that's actually quite interesting because it flies in the face of what normally happens in a string quartet. In other words, uh, the classical string quartet is a, is a rational discussion be between four equal partners. And the idea is that you arrive at some kind of blend, some, some form of synthesis of these four distinct voices. Whereas in the Stravinsky pieces, actually, it's quite different. He makes each instrument sound as different from the others as possible, gives each instrument its own distinct pitches, its own distinct rhythm, and basically makes it so that they don't really fuse at all. Nevertheless, the, the, the overall global result of this is, is a coherent musical context. So it's very interesting how he does that. Uh, in keeping with Stravinsky's basic technical features at this period of his career, there is a total absence of development in this music. Everything is basically static. It's as though he, he set up a situation and then just sort of let it spin, spin itself out for a while, and then once it was done, he just sort of stops, and that's it. And then you either move on to something else or the piece just ends. And that's very characteristic. It's a, it's a very radical thing to have done, certainly in 1914. And the other thing I would say about this piece in general, the first piece of the, of the three pieces for string quartet, is that it strongly brings to mind Eastern European folk music. So we'll have a, a more detailed look at that in a minute. One of the first things you notice when you first open the score is that it uses a compound meter. So in other words, you have a loop of three bars in which the first bar is 3-4, and then you have two bars of 2-4, and then it repeats. So you have a rhythmic period that altogether lasts for seven beats. And the cello in this texture is assigned the task of meeting out the basic pulse. So the cello is the instrument that, that provides the rhythmic foundation of the entire work. And you can see that the cello plays this simple repeating rhythmic pattern again and again. ba 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 ba, which certainly again uh, makes you think of the irregular repeating rhythmic patterns in Eastern European folk music. The viola reinforces 
this cello rhythm. And the viola is actually interesting in the in the sort of overall texture of this work because it actually has two functions simultaneously. You can see that the viola part is written in two staves. The upper staff is simply a held drone played on the, at the viola's open D string. And the lower sta staff, these quarter notes here, are to be played pizzicato. So the, the viola is, on the one hand, reinforcing the pizzicato notes of the cello, is reinforcing the, the strong attacks in the cello part with the pizzicato, and at the same time it's playing this drone. And the other interesting thing about that is that he's asking the viola player to play arco and pizzicato on the same string at the same time. The first violin part is rhythmically independent from the sort of bedrock foundation of the cello and the viola. And it is playing a repeating phrase that is rather long and that you hear four and a half times identically over the course of the work. And basically the, the, the rhythmic structure of the first violin part has nothing to do with the underlying metrical structure of the work. In fact, you could certainly bar it differently, you could do away with the bar lines altogether. Uh, it doesn't really relate in any particularly obvious way to the underlying structure of 3-4, 2-4, 2-4. So the first violin is rhythmically independent from the others. And interestingly, the second violin is also rhythmically independent from the others, but in a different way. And if you have a look at the second violin part, which I've got uh, highlighted in blue here, you can see that it's crossing over the bar line, and it has a constantly shifting relationship to the other parts from a rhythmic perspective. The other interesting thing is there is a, per a periodicity also in the second violin part in the sense that you have uh, a group of four notes, F-sharp, E, D-sharp, C-sharp, that repeats again and again and again. And that's all the second violin does throughout the entire piece. But it's slightly more complicated than that in the sense that the violinist will play this group of four notes twice, so we can see that in the upper system here, and then when it comes back again, it plays that group of four notes once, and it keeps alternating. So it alternates uh, twice, once, twice, once, and so on and so forth. And then there will be a gap between successive iterations of this little gesture of between 9 and 11 beats each time, and it keeps changing. So there's no absolutely strict, rigorous uh, pattern between uh, the, the sort of different iterations of this gesture, but nevertheless, there is a kind of regular periodicity in the sense that it keeps alternating between groups of two and groups of one. So now that we've had a look at the way rhythm functions in this work, I'd like to have a look at timbre, because if each instrument sort of occupies its own rhythmic world, it's equally true of the timbre. So having a look at the score here, we can see that in the first violin part, Stravinsky indicates sur le sol, which means that the entire part is to be played on the fourth string, the G string of the violin. And that that's sort of okay in itself, except that you can see that the, the part lies an octave above the open G string. So the lowest note is a G, an octave above the, the open G string, and then it goes up to the C, a perfect fourth above that. So that's very, very high. So that means that the, the first violinist is going to be playing on the in the absolute highest register, the highest position on the G string. So that will create a very distinctive and unusual timbre. It's going to be a sort of hollow, raspy, kind of impure sound. Whereas normally, uh, a line that fits in this kind of register, you would play more likely on the third string rather than the fourth. So there's that. And then Stravinsky additionally indicates glisser avec toute la longueur de l'archer jusqu'à la fin. So in other words, play with a very rapid uh, bow movement throughout. So he wants the, the violinist to have this very, very quick, rapid bow movement so that you use the entire length of the bow the entire time. So that will also reinforce the sort of raspy, impure uh, tone quality of the violin. And I think the reason he's doing this is basically he doesn't want the violin to sound like a conventional violin. He wants it to sound like a sort of, a sort of cheap uh, folk instrument. Now let's have a look at the second violin. Now, the second violin is just playing this one gesture over and over again that we looked at earlier, uh, this, this four-note group of F-sharp, E, D-sharp, C-sharp, and he marks it sur le sol, uh, so similarly to the first violin, he's playing uh, on the G-string, so high up on the G-string, and he also marks du talon, so he wants the violinist to play this group of four notes at the frog. So you're going to get a very, very sharp, 
short attack. And he additionally writes excessivement sec, so excessively dry. So he wants this sort of very sharp, short uh, interjection kind of uh, with a very strong attack. And that doesn't really bring to mind a conventional string instrument. It makes one think maybe more of a, a brass instrument or a woodwind instrument in, in, in terms of this sort of articulation. The violin, or sorry, the, the viola, as we mentioned earlier, is playing this continuous drone on the open uh, D string on the viola's uh, second string, and at the same time is playing pizzicato. So the the, the viola here is, is providing the role of the drone, and in order to uh, sort of uh, alter the timbre of the instrument, he marks sul ponticello until the end. So the, the viola is playing close to the bridge throughout the entire movement. And again, that, I think, is to create this sort of noisy, impure tone quality that he wants, something kind of harsh, something that brings to mind an instrument such as the hurdy-gurdy, for example. And the cello is playing pizzicato throughout the movement and with these very, very sharp, short attacks and, and a constant alternation between forte and piano dynamics. And the, the cello, because it is providing the sort of rhythmic foundations, the rhythmic backbone of the piece, has an almost percussive function within the ensemble altogether. So it's as though each of the, the four instruments of the string quartet were sort of role-playing and, and assuming a different instrumental role. So you have the, vi the first violin that is clearly a soloist and is clearly the melodic instrument. You have the second violin that's doing these sort of regular jabbing inter interjections. You have the viola that's playing a drone, and you have the cello that is playing a sort of regular percussive pattern. And it's actually not unlike what you might get in a jazz band or certainly a rock band. Let's have a look at how the pitch organization works in this piece. So to further compound the extreme individualization of each instrument in this string quartet, Stravinsky assigns a different group of pitches to each instrument, and each instrument sort of stays on them throughout the entire course of the movement. So the first violin plays only four notes, the second violin plays four different notes, the viola plays its drone on the open D string, and the cello plays a group of three pitches over and over and over again. And what's also interesting about this is that each instrument suggests a very different tonal context so the first violin plays this little four-note fragment that could very well be a fragment of a G major scale. Now, we don't really have enough pitches and enough harmonic motion to uh, create a real uh, idea of a, a, a pitch center or a, a tonal context of any particular kind. But nevertheless, these four pitches certainly do fit within a G major scale. And the second violin is playing pitches that again, are, are somewhat ambiguous, but certainly call to mind a C-sharp minor scale. So it's as though we have this, this sort of tritone polarization between a C-sharp and a G, and that is also incidentally a technique that you get quite a lot in Bartok. So we have these two sort of fragmentary diatonic scales in the violins, and then the viola and cello basically form a unit. And you can see that the, the, the C-sharp that is only heard in the introduction in the viola part is the same pitch uh, in the same octave, but spelled differently as the D-flat that we have in the cello part. So they're basically forming a single unit. And if you look at the four notes that, uh, when you add them up, are played collectively by the viola and the cello, you have C, D-flat, D, and E-flat, and that is nothing other than a fragment of the chromatic scale, a little four-note chromatic segment. So we have this superposition of three different tonal worlds, a suggestion of G major, a suggestion of C-sharp minor, and a suggestion of total chromaticism, and all three are going on simultaneously. It's in the first violin part that we have perhaps the highest degree of sophistication in terms of the, the way this piece is structured. It's a very, very interesting group of three phrases that the violinist is playing and, and repeats um, identically four and a half times over the course of the movement. So this uh, group of three phrases, I've, I've, well, I've provided it here, and I've cut it up into phrases A, B, and C, and I've pre pre presented it also uh, without the bar lines, because again, this, this phrase is totally asymmetrical, and it doesn't really fit in with the rhythmic scheme that is provided by the cello in the work. So we have a first phrase that is 11 beats long, 
and that contains several different gestures within it that uh, recur in different ways throughout the three phrases. So again, we have a very, very limited pitch vocabulary here, so the same elements and the same rhythmic figures keep recurring throughout the, the three phrases. So we start off with an ascending four-note pattern, so la si do, which I've labeled X. And then we have the pattern la si do si la sol la, and that also returns, we'll have a look at that in a minute. And then finally we end with la sol, la sol, which sounds sort of like a cadential gesture. It's a very sort of elementary, rudimentary cadential gesture, and it clearly signals the end of each phrase. In phrase B here, the second sort of sub-phrase of this group, we have uh, a phrase that lasts for six beats, and we find the exact same little fragment, Y, as, as we had seen in phrase A, but backwards, so the pitches and the rhythms are heard in backwards order. Now, it's, it's possible that this could actually be an accident, that Stravinsky hadn't really done this on purpose, because given the very restricted range of pitches available in this phrase, and also the fact that the same uh, rhythmic figures keep returning, it, it's not impossible that it could have been an accident, but I don't really think so. I mean, it's 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 very the, the whole phrase is is constructed in the most sophisticated manner, so it's it's quite ingenious the way this whole thing works. And then after we've heard this this backwards uh, iteration of why, so basically this is a this is a permutation of elements that we've already heard in the first phrase. We end with the same cadential gesture, la sol, but instead of hearing it twice, we hear it only once perhaps because this is a shorter phrase, and we don't need to emphasize its ending quite as much. The third phrase, phrase C, is slightly longer than the preceding phrase. It's six and a half beats long, and we have that, that same sort of four-note um, ascending la, sol la si do here at the, at the very outset, but in backwards order, so do la si sol. And then we end again with the exact same cadential gesture at the end of the phrase. And one other thing that's very, very interesting about this phrase is that it's constructed in such a way that the last note of the last phrase is the same as the first note of the first phrase. So that makes it uh, actually quite difficult when you're listening to the piece to put your finger exactly on where the phrases end and where they start to repeat again. And because there is also a high degree of structural redundancy and self-similarity in these three phrases, you don't really know exactly what's what's going on. There's a, there's a very strong sense of coherence, there's a very strong sense of hearing the same material again, but you never know exactly where it ends and, and exactly where it begins until you actually sit down and analyze it. And there's yet another layer of complexity that makes it even more difficult to perceive this, which is the fact that the three other instruments in the string quartet are themselves pursuing all these different rhythmic periods that are asynchronous with the violin's period and that uh, start and stop at different points. So no matter where you are in this piece, the different elements, which in themselves are repetitive and simple, are going to line up in a different way. And you're always going to have something that's coming to an end and, and sort of halfway through that something else is starting or something else is, is beginning or finishing. Or, and so you have a constant, uh, a constant rearrangement of these simple uh, basic elements again and again and again. So the piece is just amazingly well constructed. And, and again, in, in conclusion, I'd like to just say that I find it absolutely amazing that you can take a piece that lasts for less than one minute and talk about it for over 20 minutes and, and not really get to the bottom of it. And that really shows you something about the incredible uh, sort of semantic compaction, the, the incredible amount of information it's possible to pack into a piece. And the way that you hear all of this, the way that you perceive it, the way you take in this information, you, you don't take it in really uh, in, in, in real time exactly. You, you experience something that's very complex and it takes you quite a few hearings and possibly also uh, quite, a, quite a lot of time in just thinking about what you've heard to unpack it all and realize what you've heard. So you don't really apprehend all of this information in real time over the course of the unfolding of the piece. So it's a, an absolutely beautiful work. Uh, I would strongly encourage you to listen to the, the three movements altogether, listen to them multiple times. And if you are intrigued also by the parallel with Webern, check out the three little pieces for cello and piano and listen to them as well.